Hello. Today I want to talk to you about how to discern a false religion. Many, many religions out there are false, including many of the religions that go by the name of Christianity. It's important for us to have some basic understanding about God's true religion, which is Christianity, and about the Bible itself. A couple years ago, actually just last year, I purchased this book. It's called The Buddha Said by uh, a man named Osho, a Buddhist. And I was really um, amazed by it. The reason I bought it, I looked at a few of the pages uh, at the bookstore. I think it was at a Barnes and Noble. And the things that he was saying were um, profound, very profound. In fact, they were really biblical truths. He was teaching things that Buddha taught many years ago. And he was explaining these things in a way that was, all I can say is profound. It was uh, almost like reading scripture itself. And, you know, I contemplated that and realized that, of course, there are going to be truths in most of the religions of the world. God has given us a conscience whereby we know truth. We know things that are right and things that are wrong. Every culture, for example, has laws against theft, laws against adultery, laws against murder, and so on. We are now living in an age where the law is being changed. And that's going to come in a lot into what I say with respect to how to discern a false religion. Before I get to that, though, I want to say Buddha did not believe in God. Interesting. Buddhist, a true Buddhist does not believe in God. Well, there's a verse in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 says this. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. God is real. There is a God. And by faith, we understand that and we begin to grow in the knowledge of God as we, when we come to faith. But with respect to what I just mentioned about law, I want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. For example, here, I believe he's talking about how people will use the words of Paul to say that the law is utterly irrelevant now. So Peter continues, he says, right after mentioning Paul's letters, verse 17, he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, that people will twist the scripture, knowing this, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Let me read that again. Take care 
that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. This is how we know a false religion. Every time you begin to look into someone's new teaching, like a new age teacher, especially, and, and there's so many, especially people who are given to uh, looking for aliens and believing that we have lots of different planets out there and that the earth is being visited by aliens. They will, they will have a very, um, typically a very lawless attitude toward religion. For them, all of the very strange things that have become the norm in America and other places is okay. For example, um, blatant promiscuity, pornography, homosexuality, homosexual acts, homosexual marriage, transgenderism. All of these things are considered to be okay. Because what they've done is they have discarded God's law and they have developed a fluid idea of law, of right and wrong. Basically, they have come to the place where they call good evil and evil good. As long as the person is in that position, in that state of mind, in that religious state of mind where they call good evil and evil good, they cannot repent. That's the unforgivable sin. And that's why it's unforgivable because if a person cannot repent of his sin, he cannot believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. Because there is no sin. As long as someone believes that there is no sin, there's no need for Jesus. There's no need for the atonement of the blood of Jesus. It's irrelevant. Why would you, why would you ever have faith in that if there is no sin? And so anyone, and there are multitudes of Christians who have accepted this um, travesty of the homosexual agenda in this country of America and also in many of the other countries of the world. They're lawless. And by definition, they are without faith because you can't have faith in someone for the forgiveness of sin if there is no sin. Now, this takes me to a very interesting scripture that all of you should know. This is in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, starting at verse 16, says this, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. I, the person I there speaking, is Jesus himself. The children whom the Lord, who his father gave him, are the overcomers. Jesus and the overcomers are for signs and for wonders in Israel. And then verse 19 says, And when they shall say to you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God instead? Then verse 20, To the law and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this word, According to the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in them. 
What is the law? God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, and then explanations of the commandments to Moses in the book of Exodus. You have laws, specific laws, that Moses wrote down in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those laws are still relevant, but we're not saved by those laws or by obedience to those laws. If I perfectly obey the law, if I could have perfectly obeyed the law from the beginning, then I could have earned heaven from my own merit, but no one can do that. Only one has done that, and that's Jesus. None of us even understand the law, understand all the law, but we do understand some things. We do understand do not murder, do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery. We understand have no other gods before me, do not worship idols, do not make idols and bow down to them, honor your mother and your father. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Do not covet. Paul said, I would not have known what it meant to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. But then he began to understand how this lust for things came to him. In the law, God calls homosexual acts abominations. The law called for the stoning of people who practiced homosexuality. Well, also for people who committed adultery. The law called for stoning. And now we have rampant adultery in our culture. Concerning the testimony, I want to read another verse that is very profound. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. To prophesy means to speak forth the word of God. And here, John tells us in the book of Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does the whole Bible speak of? speaks of Jesus. Remember in the wilderness when Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, he struck a rock in order to get water for the thirsty people. The New Testament tells us that that rock followed Israel and that that rock was Jesus. Now that's profound. That's astounding. How is that? We can't even imagine how does a rock follow Jesus, or I'm sorry, follow Israel, and how can a rock be Jesus? But yet, many times in the Psalms, you have David, for example, speaking about the rock of his salvation, God being that rock. And so God was with Israel through the wilderness. One of the other reasons I want to bring this message today has to do with a series of videos I recently did explaining uh, a song that I recently wrote called A A Fairy Tale. And I explained how that song is an allegory that explains a very important 
spiritual principle. But we have to be careful. Just because we understand that God speaks in parables and God speaks in allegories, it doesn't mean that everything in the scripture was just a story that did not happen. No, it's real. It's very real. Adam was the first man. Adam was created by God. Eve was created by God from Adam. In Genesis, you have the lineage of the sons of of Adam that begin with Seth. And then the seventh, counting with Adam being number one, the seventh from Adam is Enoch. And then in the book of Jude, in the New Testament, Jude quotes a scripture from the book of Enoch and introduces it by saying Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Jude is saying Enoch was a historical figure, a historical person who really existed. If we try to spiritualize everything or say everything is just an allegory or just a story to tell a spiritual meaning, but not historically accurate, then once again, we will come into error and we will end up at a place of lawlessness where we will begin to call evil good and good evil. We will begin to approve of the abominations that men and women do all of the time in these days. So going back to the beginning, Second Peter, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless men and lose your own stability. Earlier, in a, I believe it was this very same chapter, must have been in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me look at that. That really really will bring this home. I'm going to I'm going to read the whole chapter. But false prophets also arose among the people. And just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Remember, it was homosexuals who were wanting to, to have sex with these male angels who had come to Lot in Sodom. Verse 9 again 
of Second Peter chapter 2. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of the judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. This is talking about Satan. You do not speak lightly about Satan or any spiritual power. We have to understand that God has granted them authority. And remember in the book, book of Jude, when Moses, when the, Satan was disputing the, bottle, the body of Moses, Michael, the angel, said, The Lord rebuke you. He did not rail against Satan himself. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for the wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, they have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. From them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. See, people escape error. People repent of their sin and they come to Christ. They come to Jesus. And then we have these, a false religion, these many of whom are Christians, who say, oh, it's okay for you to have your homosexual flings. Oh, it's okay for you to have your adulter adulterous fling, to have your um, concubine, to have your mistress. It's okay to have a little sex outside of marriage. It's okay for you young boys and girls to have sex before you get married. These people who are just coming to Christ, they're barely escaping from this, this world of evil. And then you have false teachers come because they have said that the law is irrelevant because they have said that you don't have to obey the law. These people promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first. I know almost no Christian who understands this verse or the next. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. What this is saying is this. It would be better that you never repented. It would be better that you never believed in Jesus than if you have believed in Jesus, you walked away from sin, but then you fell into the false doctrine, the lawlessness that said, it's okay to do these things. And then began to live a life of sin once again and also taught others that they can live a life of sin. It's going to be worse for you then than if you had never believed. What does that mean? 
I thought if I never believed, I'm going to go to hell and burn for eternity. And yet, here he's talking about people who believed. What about you people who believe in once saved, always saved? People who believed and then began to walk in sin again, it's going to be worse for them than if they had never believed. Does that mean their torment in hell is going to be worse? The flames are going to be hotter? Or what? First of all, it means that almost nobody understands what hell is. Almost no one understands what the lake of fire is. Almost no one understands what the purposes of God are. Almost no one understands what the redemption of Jesus Christ means. Almost no one understands what the outer darkness is. We need to take the warnings of Scripture seriously. God will not be mocked. God is a holy and righteous God. And any of us who ever want to see Him must desire to be perfect even as He is perfect. None of us are perfect right now. But there are some of us who want to be. There are some of us who have decided that we really do want to be perfect as our God is perfect. Anyone who's satisfied with anything less than that will always be outside of the kingdom of God will always be outside in the outer darkness. How far away, how dark, how pitiful, how tormenting will that existence be until they begin to turn and they begin to say, God, there really is good and evil. There really is right and wrong. There really is truth. Ah, is that why you gave us the law? So that we would understand the truth? I think so. I think so. And now finally, let's go to the last book of the Old Testament, the last verses of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Israel is the code name for God's overcomers, for those who will get in to heaven, into the new Jerusalem. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. My prayer is that God will not strike our land with a decree of utter destruction. That we will not see horrendous hell upon earth, but that we will begin to see repentance. We will begin to see people remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that God commanded him. Let us all turn from our wicked ways and follow the ways of God. Walk in his ways, in purity and righteousness and holiness. Identify the false prophet. Identify the false church. Identify the false religion. 
whatever religion that is. You can always identify the false religion because they all disobey God.